grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. I apologize again for last week when my voice gave out. Um, took care of myself, went to the doctor, and uh, got some help. So I'm feeling better. And appreciate your patience and prayers. So the text for this morning is Luke chapter 15, which is one of those chapters in the Bible. I want you to know this is one of the, this is a treasure chapter. It's a treasure chapter because it's three parables. The whole chapter is three parables, and it's about lostness. That's why I had children's sermon have to do with lostness. The parable of the lost sheep. Remember that one? How many sheep did the shepherd have? A hundred, and he lost how many? Ten? One percent. One percent. What did he do? Go, ah, 99 is close enough. What did he do? He looked for it until he found it. When he found it, he was happy. He was happy. Lostness is sad in God's eyes. Happy when you find. The second parable, these are the short ones. The one that is the sermon text for today is the lengthy one. The second one was the parable of the lost coins. The lady had how many silver coins? I think they were silver. Ten. And how much you lose? One. Ten percent. A little bit better, but ten percent. She could have said, oh, I'll have to get by with the nine coins I have. But what'd she do? And it was at night, what'd she do? She turned on all the lights, and she swept until she found it. When she found it, what'd she do? She woke up her neighbors. She woke up her neighbors. She woke up Laura and said, Laura, guess what? And Laura goes like, Lydia, don't you know what time it is? Oh, Laura, I have such good news. I found my lost coin. Come on over. We're going to have a cup of coffee and celebrate. And what? You would go. Laura, you know, she goes all the time. Okay, the parable of lostness. Lostness is sad when it's found. It's happy. You celebrate it, celebrate. Okay, and then our text for today, which has the context, verses 1 through 3. Jesus tells these three parables in front of a, a crowd of Pharisees and scribes who are kind of stuffy. Uh, and they're the churchgoers. So you'd think, you'd think, you know, Jesus would be careful what he said because they're the ones that sat in the pew Okay, and yet he had some message to say, say to them. And uh, he was being criticized for associating with tax collectors and sinners. And the Pharisees and the scribes didn't think that was appropriate. Especially when he ate dinner with him, because dinner as it is today is a sign of intimacy. It's a sign of friendship. Hmm? If I come over to your house for dinner, or we go to the restaurant to dinner, you, dinner, or you come over to my house, it's intimacy. The conversation is intimate. We're friends. We're supporting one another. And Jesus was being criticized for that. So Jesus told these three parables of lostness. And the third one is the one that we have uh, today, the parable of the sun. So you have sheep, one out of 100. You have coins, one out of 10. And you have people, one out of one out of two. And the parable has something to teach us here, the midpoint of Lent. Today is the midpoint of Lent, about the 20th day, the season of Lent, which is kind of a somber season where we walk with Jesus, where we reflect, reflect on the sacrifice that he had to pay. What a sacrifice, suffering and death by crucifixion, not for himself, not because he did anything wrong, but because our sins demanded, demanded payment. Now, there are certain things, just to take a little detour right now, that I don't associate with each other. I don't associate with each other. For example, I associate, I associate spring and baseball together, but I don't associate chicken and waffles, which is the rage. I've never had chicken and waffles. Chicken and waffles. So I don't associate. I don't associate black with weddings. Ask my wife about our wedding, which was several years ago. And Judy came to our wedding wearing what? Black dress. Okay, we still kind of talk about it. Now maybe, you know, it's not a big deal. We didn't confront Judy and says, what are you doing here with a black dress? But she wore a black dress at wedding. And if there are tears at a wedding, I associate tears of happiness, not tears of sadness. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, at funerals, I associate black, but I don't associate what? Well, you don't know what I associate. White and colorful garb. I know it's kind of a tradition. And if there are tears, I don't expect the tears to be like, yay, he's gone. But tears of grief, tears of grief. 
if not for yourself, for those who really miss him or her who is gone. So I don't associate those things with uh, weddings. Other things I don't have associations with are chocolate and pretzels. Don't contradict me. <laughs> they just don't seem to go together. <coughs> Moving on, I don't associate tuxedos at McDonald's. All right? I don't associate shouting at cemeteries. Remember in the old days in the hospitals, they had signs out on the street that said quiet or quiet hospital zone? Remember that? Okay. I don't think they do that anymore. But cemeteries, if I went to a cemetery, I really don't expect to hear a lot of loud noise. I don't associate three-piece suits or high heels at the beach. Do you? I don't associate, well, I do. I can have breakfast for dinner. But when our kids were growing up, they would ask, you know, the, uh, the obvious question daily, what's for supper? What's for supper? And a lot of times they would be happy, and sometimes we didn't know, so we'd put them off. But if we said pancakes and bacon, they would go, blah, that's not for supper. That's breakfast. Breakfast, they didn't associate breakfast food with supper. Now, I could handle pancakes and bacon for supper. And the other thing is around, I know someone uh, who uh, eats uh, supper at breakfast, not to mention any names, but Sid. Oh. When we have men's Bible study on Tuesday morning, Tom will get the bacon and eggs, and I'll get the pancakes, and uh, Henry will get, what do you get, Henry? Biscuits and gravy? I won't say anything about that. <laughs> and Sid will study the menu, and he'll go, I'll take the Cobb salad and the fish tilapia with the red potatoes, right? So do that. But that. I don't associate joy with Lent. But joy with Lent. The hymns are kind of dirgy. The colors are somber and muted. Mm. The liturgy is kind of austere. Lots of confession and absolution, sometimes twice in a service. Mm. And this emphasis on suffering, the suffering of Jesus and our sins and our sins nailed him to the cross, which is all true. But today's text, today's text is, stop it. There's joy in Lent. There's joy in Lent, and we draw on the third parable of Luke chapter 15, which talks a lot about joy, and not just, ha, happy, I'm happy today, how are you, fine. Party joy, celebrate joy, kick up your heels joy, music and dancing joy, and it's drawn from the Father's compassion and goodwill towards his son, which as you know is a metaphor or an analogy for our father's joy that when we're lost and found, he is tickled pink. The sin of the first son came when he left the house way before he went out to the city or wherever he went, way before he squandered his property, but when he left the house, when one day he got up and he said, Dad, I'm running away from home. I'm leaving. And I want my inheritance now to support my life away from this place, away from this. It broke his father's heart. It broke his father's heart when he left because he broke up the family. In those days, the younger son would get a third of the property, and he wouldn't just get the third of the bank account that his dad had. He got a third of the property. So if his dad was a farmer, the younger son would get a third of what generated revenue, what kept the family going, the economy, the house. So this son, when he announced that he was leaving, not only broke his father's heart in an emotional way, he broke up the security and the living that the family was, am I saying this right? was depending on. He really wreaked havoc. And that was his sin. And that's your sin. And that's mine. 
not so much the specific sins and the, and the lifestyle that we choose to live, but the fact that we, we leave the house, we break up the family, we turn our backs on the Father, we think of ourselves and we forget about the family. Remember a couple weeks ago I asked you to reflect on the, the brokenness of this family? about the fact that some people have left and it really hurts us, hurts us spiritually. We need them and they need us. And I propose that we do something about that. And I propose it again that, that daily, we, weekly, monthly, we, we help God f escort those people back because our family is broken when they're, when they're not here. That's what the son does. That's what you do. You get mad at the pastor. I get mad at the prisoners. I tell Jane, I'm done with this bunch. I'm breaking the family. I'm breaking up the family. I'm sinning against God. I'm going my own way. I'm going to a foreign land and getting lost in the city. And there he squandered his, you know the details. He squandered his inheritance until he was flat broke. And then he didn't come home. He says, okay, well, I'll have to get a job. I'm going to stay out here as long as I can. I'll have to get a job. And he looked for a job, and he found a job, a bad one, what they call a menial job, what they call, um, what do they call the wages? Minimum wage. Minimum wage or less. And he fed the pigs, which was the last thing a Jew would do. Someone says for this guy, for this Jewish boy to work with the pigs, in essence, made him a Gentile. So he was turning his back on his ancestral, his spiritual family and roots and stuff like that. How insulting to himself. And then he woke up, probably because he was starving to death. He was starving to death. And he says to myself, okay, what an idiot. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to confess. And you know the details. So he gets up and he goes home. And he's, I think he's practicing the whole way. Father, I've sinned against you and against God and um, however that goes. And I ask you to be not your son, but to be one of your servants. Okay, he's practicing out the whole way. And while he's, while he's practicing this a long way off, dad sees him. Dad sees him. And the boy can't even get the confession out. He can't even get the confession out. And this is why this parable, I think, is misnamed. The parable of the prodigal son. No, yes, but no, it's the parable of the forgiving father. The forgiving father who runs out and he doesn't let the boy say a word. Well, he does eventually, but he comes out and he meets the son and he embraces him. And then the son gets out his confession. And the father says, forget it, forget it, forget it. Come on in, come on in. And he calls the servants and he treats them like a king. The ring, the robe, the feast, the music, the dancing. Mm, such, such grace. There's joy in Lent because that same grace is yours and mine. He comes and he just, I'm so glad to see you, Marie. I'm so glad to see you, Jim. I'm so glad to see you, newcomers. I'm so glad to see you we haven't seen in two years. I'm so happy and he throws a party. He throws a party. His grace is so much bigger than our sin. Speaking of which, you know who's on the sidelines? Intermission, 10 minutes, act two. Where's the curtain rises? Who do we see? Grumpo, big brother. Grumpo, who has his own issues because he can't forgive, he can't forget. He's not like his dad, gracious and generous. He's actually resentful. He's resentful. He's resentful towards his father, not towards his brother, but towards his father's grace. It's kind of wicked. And yet we do it. We do it. I do it. I go to a pastor's conference, and I, 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 I go faithfully. I go to all 12 meetings a year, and to the extras, to the installations and ordinations, and I never see brother so-and-so, and he shows up one time, and I go, what's he doing here? Who does he think he is? He calls himself a pastor. He just shows up at these big events, you know. That's, 
resentment towards God's grace. And you have the same problem. And what does the father do? The, remember, this is the parable of the forgiving father. Let it go, guy. Just, I'm just so happy it's appropriate that you're here. You're not lost. I'm so happy you're not lost. I'm so happy your brother's not lost. Let's have joy. Jesus had joy when he went to the cross. Now, I don't think Jesus was smiling when he was on the cross. I think his suffering was so intense, so bitter, not just physical, but spiritual and emotional and relational. But he had joy because Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 tells us this. And we'll close with this. Let us look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus found joy in Lent because he, he was going to have the satisfaction of accomplishing the mission which the Father, for which the Father sent him. To come, lead the perfect life on your behalf and mine, and to pay for the sins of the world by dying on the cross. That's the joy of satisfaction. And Jesus also has the real joy of now ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, preparing a place for us, ruling the church and the world. Dear friends, let's do the same thing. We can have the joy of satisfaction if we do the same thing, and that is reach out for the lost. Let's make Grace Church a church that has the habit of getting on the phone on Sunday afternoon and saying, hey, we missed you. you. Everything okay? Hmm? Or stopping by. And the newcomers, when you share the peace, don't just go to the people you know. I know Jane. She knows me. Go to someone you don't know especially a visitor, okay? And the joy that we will have forever in heaven when Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. Even though life is tough, even though discipleship is tough, you have joy now. Have you ever been happy for like no reason? I think that's God-given because you're, you're heaven bound. You're heaven bound. Your eyes on the cross. God give you a rich measure of joy during Lent and always for Christ's sake. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus into life everlasting.